Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. Today we are reading this very interesting guy, St. Augustine, and his confessions. We're in book two, and we're picking up on paragraph six. Now, as you recall, in our last reading, he did a confession where he admitted to stealing some very nice pears when he was 16, and that he did it because he just wanted to have the gratification and he didn't do it out of desperation so he's admitting his his fault and so there's a point here that I wanted to share with you if the crime of theft which I committed that night as a boy of 16 were a living thing I could speak to it and ask what it was that to my shame I loved in it I had no beauty because it was robbery now here again, he's pointing out, theft, there's nothing beautiful in theft. It's not. It is true that the pears which we stole had beauty because they were created by you, the good God, who are the most beautiful of all beings and the creator of all things. Now we call Allah the creator of all things. And what's interesting here is that he contends that beauty cannot be found in robbery. The pears had beauty because they were created by God, which I found to be quite a unique way of looking at it. The supreme good and my own true good. But it was not the pears that my unhappy soul desired. I had plenty of my own, better than those, and I only picked them so that I might steal. Now here he's admitting he didn't do it because they were just like extravagantly way better than his pairs that he had where he was from. Now to you and I this may seem trivial just because we have such rampant crime today. But back then people probably had more of a weighted soul. Today San Francisco and in much of the Bay Area if you steal less than $900 the police will not come and get you. That's why Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, they're moving out of California and you can look at those news stories. CVS closing 13 locations due to constant robbery and liberals are soft on crime and the district attorneys are activists who don't think that you should be arrested for theft. So for us today, stealing pears seems trivial but for St. Augustine, he's pointing out a more psychological approach to it, which I find to be quite unique. And I only picked them so that I might steal. So he stole for the satisfaction of stealing, not out of need and desperation. For no sooner had I picked them than I threw them away and tasted nothing in them but my own sin. So notice this, tasted nothing in them but my own sin. So the pears were nice. They were delicious probably. But what he's saying is that I didn't taste the sweetness of the natural sugars in it, nor the wonderful juice. Rather, I just tasted my own sin. It's quite deeply introspective, which I relished and enjoyed. So he didn't enjoy and relish in the flavor of the pears, but in the sin of the action. If any part of one of those pears passed my lips, it was the sin that gave it flavor. Now this is a very honest thing here. The action itself gave the flavor, not the object itself. And now, O oh Lord my God, now that I ask, what pleasure had I in that theft? I find that it had no beauty to attract me. I do not mean beauty of the sort that justice and prudence possess nor the beauty that is in man's mind and in his memory and the life that animates him. So here you're getting at different types of beauty, right? The beauty of justice and prudence, beauty that's in your mind, beauty that's in your memory and life and what animates you in your life, nor the beauty of the stars and their allotted places or of the earth and sea teeming with new life, born to replace the old as it passes away. 
So here, the beauty of the sublime, beauty of life, of magnitude. These simple pairs didn't have that, but he's describing the theft of the pairs and that there's no beauty in robbery because it's not something pure or good. But the relishing in the sin is what caused it. So I think he's telling us this so that we don't conflate the rush of the sin with beauty itself. It did not even have the shadowy deceptive beauty which makes vice attractive. Now this is very interesting because he described another element of beauty which is that shadowy deceptive type that is sort of mysterious that lures you and calls you and beckons you to it. No, he didn't have that he said. Pride, for instance, which is a pretense of superiority imitating yours for you alone are God supreme over all. Although you alone are God supreme over all. Very interesting. We call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the supreme in glory. Or ambition, which is only a craving for honor and glory. So ambition, as he defines it, is a craving for honor and glory. Which I would agree with. Pretty accurate definition. When you are when you alone are to be honored before all. You alone are to be honored before all. Now that is something that we Muslims can agree with. And you alone are glorious forever. I would agree with that. Cruelty is the weapon of the powerful, used to make others fear them. Cruelty is the weapon of the powerful. Now, this goes down to what does he mean by powerful? Those of government, you either rule by fear, or you rule by love, or a riddle of both. Fear is very potent, but if you have a common criminal who doesn't have any material power but is cunning and deceptive and malicious and vicious he has fear and is cruel yet is not materialistically powerful I think cruelty can be wielded as a weapon by many but by the powerful I think he's contending it, is, it always remains which one could argue, how do you, where's the line between justice and cruelty? That's a good one to analyze with deep reflection. Yet yeah, no one is to be feared but God alone. <laughs> Fear none but Allah, because Allah is the one who disposes all affairs. From those whose power nothing can be snatched away or stolen by any man, at any time or place, or by any means. The lust will use caresses to win the love they crave for. Now that's interesting. That's a unique way of looking at it, wouldn't you say? Yet no caress is sweeter than your charity, and no love is more rewarding than the love of your truth. So here he's getting at how lust and the craving for it cannot compare to God's charity upon you and the love of truth itself that comes from God which shines in beauty above all else inquisitiveness has all the appearance of a thirst for knowledge yet you have supreme knowledge of all things yes we know that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge over all things and when you are inquisitive you definitely have a thirst for knowledge so I agree with him on that. Ignorance, too, and stupidity choose to go under the mask of simplicity and innocence. Because you are simplicity itself, and no innocence is greater than yours. I wouldn't agree with that. I don't know if you would call God simplistic. The law can be simple, as in Allah sent us... He's arguing from a Christian perspective, I understand. But Allah sent us the clear admonitions right simple for us to get easy to understand so there's simplicity in that but I don't think that then means that God himself 
is therefore simple. Innocence, because if you say the word innocence, it means there's the opposite of guilty. And God can never be guilty. Now, innocence, now Allah is free of need, free of blame, because we have our own free will. So Allah is innocent of what we commit that harms our own souls. But then again, I don't know if it's, we have, we have names and attributes that we give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And simplicity isn't one of them. Because in order to categorize God into a genre of simplicity means you would negate complexity. When I think complexity would be far more important because our understanding of what simplicity is would not be able to encompass God. And due to that, that would therefore prove that God is complex, not simplicity. I don't know. We'll see. You are innocent even of the harm which overtakes the wicked, for it is the result of their own actions. Oh, it's kind of like religious. <laughs> Sloth poses as the love of peace. Oh, that's a good one there. A sloth who poses as the love of peace. Very potent example. I want you to think about that. Now, there are some hippies who are like, Peace, love, man. And they just sit around smoking weed. Oh, I'm so peaceful. But it's like, you're a sloth. You don't do nothing productive. In order to have true peace, you must be capable of raw. And you can be peaceful while being productive and not being a sloth. Taking your break in moderation, but not being just a person who lies about doing nothing, reclining. Yet when certain peace is there besides the Lord, extravagance masquerades as fullness and abundance. That's really interesting phrase there. Extravagance masquerades, so it's not the real thing, as fullness and abundance. Because a masquerade is where people put on masks, and there's full and extravagant abundance in such a party. So to say that extravagance, it has this sort of fake mask of fullness and abundance when it's depraved and empty of what God approves. Because God does not approve of the extremely extravagant who hoard their wealth and don't do good deeds. Yet, the, the humble, the meek, the modest in means, there's something to be said there. That's a very interesting line because he's pointing it out for us to think about. But you are the full, unfailing store of never dying sweetness. Yeah, Allah is full of bounty. Never can anything not be done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of need and is the possessor of all and owns everything. And whatever Allah wills for you will happen. And whatever Allah does not will for you won't happen. And so the bounty is stored within God because God has all the might to decide where it ends up, how it gets dispersed. So it can never empty because Allah is never tired of giving. The spendthrift makes a pretense of liberality, but you are the most generous dispenser of all good. I like that. Allah is definitely generous. All the mercy He gives us, all the bounty He gives us. So I like how He frames this as the spendthrift looks like liberality, but they can be a spendthrift spending themselves into poverty. We are not as Muslims supposed to spend ourselves into poverty, nor hoard our wealth and be miserly. There is a balance because our family has a right upon us and we're supposed to be level-headed and reasonable with our finances. A spendthrift, someone who's just like a little bit here, a little bit here, and they can appear to be like, oh, they're just very liberal with their money. They also, we can call that reckless with their money. Oh, it's quite good. Truly quite good, I must say. What do you think, fam? I really did like this section because it gives us a lot to think about. Hope you're having a great day. See you next time.